You are everywhere, Frank. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to. <laughs> Very good. Um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever you are. I'm in Singapore, and uh, I think one of my fellow panelists is in Singapore, and Eric Bergloff is in, in the United States. Um, we have two more panelists still to join. They will join very shortly. Uh, but meanwhile, let me just get get this panel on the road. Uh, welcome to this plenary and America's new standing across the Asia Pacific region. We will be talking uh, mainly about the comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, known as the CPTPP, uh, which is a gold standard agreement among 11 countries across the Asia Pacific. Now, just, just to recap a little bit on the background, um, it started out as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, under the Obama administration. It was as part of the United States' so-called pivot to Asia. But then the Trump administration withdrew the United States from this TPP in 2017. But under Japan's leadership, uh, it was reborn as a CPTPP and went live in 2019. Since then, there's been a flurry of activity. Uh, we've had uh, membership applications from the United Kingdom, from China, from Taiwan, and I believe from Ecuador. Um, other countries are also keen to join, including South Korea, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. Um, so, but we in this session will be focusing mainly on issues relating to the United States and China uh, in the context of the TPP. And we have a star-studded panel. I'm privileged to moderate. Um, let me just introduce those who are already here. Um, Mr. Taro Kono is Japan's former Minister for Administrative and Regulatory Reform and is the head of public affairs for the LDP, the ruling party. He's also one of the country's most prominent politicians and has the biggest social media following of any um, politician in Japan. And I think uh, we'll soon find out why. Um, we also have Eric Bergloff, who is the chief economist uh, for the Asia Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Is one of the thought leaders in the building of infrastructure across Asia. So, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, we're still waiting on the other panelists, but since we have limited time, let's let's get the show on the road. Um, the first question that I have is was suggested by Frank, <clears throat> and in light of recent events, now, how will the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the sanctions that have followed? and China's tacit support for Russia, which will draw Russia and China to engage much more with Asia, likely. How will this change the calculations on the U.S. engagement with Asia? Mr. Kono, if I may go with you on that one. Thank you. Well, we are all outraged and uh, angry about this Russian invasion into Ukraine. It's intolerable, and uh, they should uh, stop this uh, aggression and pull back. But uh, I guess the uh, international community need to be united, and uh, we have to force any aggressor who are violating international rules uh, to pay high cost. Well, we assume China is closely monitoring the reaction from the international community. Uh, Xi Jinping uh, is probably planning similar thing against Taiwan sometime in the future. So how we all uh, can unite against the aggressor and uh, force the sanction, uh, I think that would send a strong message to China as well. Well, because of the uh, international economic sanction against Russia, I think uh, Russia and China, their relationship would be much, much closer. Um, we, may not, we, may, we may not be so sure that if Russia could continue selling uh, energy to Europe, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but they have alternative market in China. So if Europe cut out a uh, natural gas pipeline, I think Russia could uh, <clears throat> start supplying to China. We are a bit uh, disappointed the reaction from India. India has been abstaining in uh, votes uh, at uh, United Nations. Uh, we were hoping that we understand that India has a close relationship with Russia, but so does Japan. Uh, but uh, we were hoping that India uh, would join us because Russia is simply violating international rules and that shouldn't be acceptable to anybody. Yeah. Well, the United States probably uh, knew the Russia would invade the Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, Europe, Japan and many other countries are joining the economic sanction. So we'll see how this economic sanction and uh, casualty, uh, Russian casualty in Ukraine would have uh, impact on Russian uh, people and uh, how long Putin could continue this aggression. I think it all depends on the domestic reaction in Ukraine. And uh, I guess uh, Japan, US, Europe and many other countries need to continue uh, this sanction, and we need to be keep united for time being. Right. Thank you, Mr. Kono. Uh, we have two other panelists who've joined us, so let me welcome them. Uh, first, we have uh, Marjorie Yang, who is one of the most celebrated business leaders in Hong Kong. She's the chairperson of the Esquel Group, which is the world's leading manufacturer of men's shirts. Uh, supplying all the top brands in the world and it has operations in half a dozen nation countries covering the entire supply chain welcome Ms. yang um, and we also have the sandiga uno uh, a formerly a prominent businessman from indonesia but now holds the country's uh, portfolio of for tourism and the creative economy and he's rumored to be a future president of indonesia welcome mr uno um, thank you. I just, I just wonder if any of you would like to add to what Mr. Kono has said about the, the impact on Asia of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the sanctions that have followed and Russia, the tacit support that Russia has got from China. Any, th any additional thoughts on that subject from any of the panelists? I, I can Eric. offer, because uh, I've been uh, working in both countries, in Russia and Ukraine, and, and uh, it's a great tragedy and, and, and tremendous human suffering that we are seeing uh, right now. And, um, of course, particularly sad for for um, for me, but also for our organization, which where Russia is one of the shareholders. And, and um, we have... Um, uh, decided uh, as an institution to put our uh, investments uh, in Russia on hold and uh, we we have it declared that we are very much uh, want to try to help countries that are affected by what's going on right now and uh, there are a lot of things that w have changed uh, as a result of, of this conflict and, and uh, uh, the, there will be a lot of countries that will suffer from the high increased prices on, on energy, and the increased prices on food, and then particularly in the emerging and developing world where these, um, uh, the, the cost of, of energy and cost of food take a very large part of, of people's budget. So we came into this, you know, after a pandemic that had we, much of the developing and emerging world had used up all the buffers they had, both at the country level, na national budgets, but also individual households. And so this is an extremely difficult situation. And, and we have a responsibility together with the rest of the uh, MDB and IFI community to, to really try to help the countries that are affected now by this. Right. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? Any Anybody? or we can move on. So this, that question was not 
strictly related to the CPTPP, which is going to be the core of our discussion. So let me let me go go into that area. I think uh, a lot of observers point out that the U.S. economic links with Asia have weakened in recent years, while China's have expanded. Uh, <clears throat> what areas does the U.S. fall short? Uh, infrastructure is one of them. I mean, China is very active in infrastructure in the region. U.S. not so much. Um, what other areas uh, would the U.S. be falling short in its engagement economically with Asia? I know, Eric, since you're involved in the the whole infrastructure space, would you like to address that? Yeah, maybe I can can say. So I I was actually going to focus on when you pose that question one the thing that immediately strikes me is what happened to global value chains uh, in in asia and and it or actually globally because you know much of uh, what's happened to global value chains has been what's happened um, in in asia and um, it's very clear that if you look over a longer period since the you know, very rapid growth of these global value chains um, un- in, until the global financial crisis. But after that, the share of total exports have stagnated. But underneath that, what's happened is that in the advanced economies like Europe, like the uh, US, have lost out. And, and it's the emerging and developing world that has taken an increasing share of that. It's not only about China, it's about many countries, and particularly in Asia. And, and, uh, I think what we have seen as a result of the pandemic is that this has hit uh, particularly uh, the emerging and developing world and their participation in, in, in these uh, global value chains. And, and here is, I think, where also CTPP uh, come in, because um, this is uh, exactly the kind of uh, trading arrangement you need to, um, to, to deepen and, and, and promote global value chains. And this, right. for those countries that are participating in these global value chains, this is going to be, uh, you know, a, a, a very important boost. And of course, since China has managed to take on an, an increasing share of intermediate goods and has also managed to move up the value-added ladder, this is uh, now being used by the Chinese government as a further uh, tool to reform and, and, and bring out the, the competitive strength of, of the Chinese economy. Right. Thank you. Ms. Yang, your company is deeply involved in value chains. Uh, have you experienced much impact from the, the, the pandemic's restructuring of these value chains? Uh, have, you, have you seen this happening around you? Does this affect you, in affect your company in any way and your, your fellow uh, industri- industrialists in, in the region? I think that... Um... Over the last two or three years, uh, the global value chain is is under so much fluctuation mm-hmm. that it is um, completely different from where we started. Yeah. Which I think is a real disaster because this is a time where we really need to connect. And um, you know, you just early on, I think somebody mentioned that. We're looking at Ukraine. Well, uh, just after COVID uh, has uh, sort of uh, uh, under control. In fact, I live in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is seeing um, peak. The fifth wave is still not peaked, and we are seeing death numbers. We're seeing a hundred deaths a day. Mm. Uh, now, so let me go back to the global chain, uh, supply chain. I believe that we have an even bigger disaster that we have to plan for, which is climate change. And we need a global supply chain where everybody comes together. And when we are looking looking at biodiversity, we have to um, have everybody at the table trying to establish some rules um, well, um, uh, if we look at palm oil, you know, um, the end products, China, United States must participate, must sit around the same table and discuss. Um, now, to see the global <coughs> supply chain break down due yeah. to G- 
geopolitics due to war. This is, I mean, this is so depressing. It is even more depressing than looking at or watching the news in Hong Kong. So, um, no, I, I think uh, we must try to bring back everybody to uh, make the global supply chain work. We cannot allow it to fall apart. But that's my view. I mean, from a corporate, uh, from our company, uh, yes, we adjust. Companies will find ways to adjust. Um, there are, you know, different markets and we can adjust and pivot to different markets, but can humanity afford to lose the global supply chain? So thank you for that. Thank you, especially for bringing up the point about climate change in the relation in relation to the supply chain. Uh, Mr. Uno, Indonesia is also very much part of the supply chains in, in the region. Um, have you felt the effect of this disruption? Uh, how, how it affected you? Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me to the uh, panel. Basically, uh, first on the tension in uh, involving Russia and Ukraine, uh, definitely we're very concerned. Uh, this is exactly what we don't need uh, at the tail end of the pandemic. Um, I guess we are calling uh, all sides to restore calm, uh, reduce tension, uh, put uh, forward humanities, uh, and I guess uh, respect of uh, world peace uh, would call on uh, the world leaders to step forward and give diplomacy a chance. Uh, I think uh, this is something that we need rather than uh, rhetorics of, uh, um, I guess, uh, uh, that would escalate tensions. We also need to make sure all the refugees are taken care of and uh, uh, here we are very concerned because it will impact uh, the recovery of the economy post-pandemic, uh, uh, even further putting pressure on a crisis. Uh, as you know, crisis has, uh, uh, has been really key in terms of uh, us coming out of this uh, pandemic uh, impact, how do we make sure that the inflations and prices of food, prices of energies are uh, actually uh, affordable, especially for the bottom of the pyramid, uh, for people of uh, uh, vulnerable incomes. And uh, as we design uh, to come up from this pandemic together, uh, we need to address uh, how do we de-escalate the situations in, in Europe. Uh, secondly, I think the impact on energy is devastating. Uh, we have a record of increase in energy price in, in the last four or five days. Uh, and it will surely impact across the value chain, across the supply chain, commodity prices, food, in particular, we're seeing shortage of, um, as we go into the Ramadan uh, festivity months uh, uh, or the uh, uh, in 30 days, uh, definitely that, that would be one of the few concerns. Yeah. And on my portfolio, uh, for that involves world travel, this is exactly also not what we need as we recover from the uh, 2019 peak of uh, global travels uh, and almost uh, meltdown during the pandemic as we steadily grow the number of travelers uh, and tourism industry uh, the tensions really put a heavy burden on how we pivot into a new uh, quality and sustainability of tourism and creative economy sectors in Indonesia, these two sectors combined 
have created 35 million jobs. And uh, I think uh, this is some time that we put our heads together and see uh, what other uh, initiative that we could, uh, multilateralism, uh, in particular CTPP, uh, that uh, we can use to bring in uh, more trades, more investments, uh, because we lead trades, uh, we believe trades will lead to investment, investment will create jobs. And I think uh, it, is, it is something that we need now, a recovery that is sustainable uh, and addressing issues such as uh, issues of uh, poverty and climate change, uh, and in particular, how we um, remove all possible tensions that could lead to uh, the uh, tension in Europe escalating to the other parts of the world. Thank you. I mean, there are a lot of people in the world waiting to tra travel to Indonesia, Bali and places like that. So I hope Indonesia is able to open up fairly soon. To yeah, we, uh, we are, just to give you an update, and this is breaking, uh, we mm. just decided uh, within the last few hours that we are removing the quarantine requirement as we handle the pandemic and we started the uh, Excellency Kono, we started the uh, Narita Denpasar flight uh, without uh, quarantine uh, starting 7 of March, so basically on Monday. And we hope this is uh, transitions uh, for Indonesia, a country with almost 300 million uh, populations to uh, the tail end of the pandemic and uh, basically the number of cases that keep coming down, uh, hospitality rates, uh, casualty rates are low, and this is uh, boosting our confidence to uh, reopen uh, our tourism sectors and hopefully with no quarantines and uh, reinstatement of visa on arrival for several countries that uh, main market for the sectors for the tourism and creative economy we will be able to achieve the economic recovery and start adding new jobs and we are targeting to add around 800,000 jobs uh, this year in the sector. I think a lot of people would celebrate that news. Uh, thank you for thank you for the scoop. We all welcome you and hopefully Horaces can uh, have the run the world conference in uh, offline. Uh, physical meeting in Bali sometimes very soon. Fantastic. Look forward to that. Okay. Can I ask Camille and Paul, because I just want to sure. say something about the, the uh, impact of, of the uh, of the Ukraine-Russia, because what something we don't think of, but actually for many countries in Asia, uh, Russia and Ukraine are the most, uh, or at least among the most important. I don't know about Indonesia, but for example, if you take Sri Lanka or the Maldives, these are the two, two of the largest groups of, of tourists. So, so you know, this is also hitting these countries. Um, in addition to I mentioned energy and, and food stuff. Yes. So, so this is a very serious. Good point. Yeah. That, that is absolutely correct. Uh, and um, what uh, Eric said, uh, Russia and Ukraine both are very uh, important uh, markets for us. Uh, number of uh, tourists coming from Ukraine and Russia have steadily um, uh, growing and it's actually uh, they enjoy a much length lengthier stay so the length of stay is long and the quality of spending uh, are actually uh, much higher than the uh, average uh, tourist coming or, or uh, for Indonesia and as head of tourism forum in ASEAN, uh, now I, I see this tension is actually going to affect Thailand, it's going to affect the Philippines and in particular Indonesia as well and, and Vietnam. So yeah, this is something that we hope uh, and we will work hard to make sure that uh, the world leaders are uh, uh, opening up the uh, uh, the diplomacy lane uh, and stage uh, open up and and sit down and try to sort out because I think uh, 
this is the last thing that the world would need uh, at this juncture. Thank you. Um, if we can get back to the, the core subject of the CPTPP, um, Mr. Kono, the Japan has been a great advocate for the U.S. to join or rejoin the CPTPP. What would be the benefits for the U.S. and for Asia of the U.S. Thank government? you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> when we look back, Japan was very reluctant to join TPP at the beginning because it would uh, force Japan to open the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, TPP was supposed to be a new regional architecture to set new rules for Indo-Pacific region, not only for trade, but for labor, environment, investment, tourism, you know, all those things. So Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abe decided that Japan needs to uh, join TPP. So we pay a very high political cost, but we decided to join and we negotiated successfully. So it was originally uh, U.S., Japan, and other country would lead rulemaking for Indo-Pacific. Uh, United States used to have hub and spoke uh, relationship in Indo-Pacific. Uh, U.S. had the individual uh, trade agreement or security agreement, but our U.S. is no longer a uh, solo policeman in the world. And uh, I think the U.S. needed to transfer this hub and spoke relationship into a new regional architecture where the U.S. is probably the largest or the most powerful member, but everyone else has to uh, shoulder some burden. So Japan agreed to the idea and uh, we joined TPP. And unfortunately, President Trump pulled out uh, from the TPP. When I was a foreign minister, I even proposed we can change it uh, from Trans-Pacific Partnership to Trump-Pence Partnership. <laughs> but uh, the U.S. ran away. And uh, we are hoping that U.S. could see the point and uh, come back to TPP. Um, now we have United Kingdom uh, joining TPP and we would welcome it. Uh, that would have some European input to Indo-Pacific. We would welcome Taiwan joining uh, this uh, group. Uh, China is applying for membership of CPTPP, but I don't think China is going to meet the high standard of TPP. I'm um, not quite sure why China is pretending to apply for TPP. I don't think they are making any effort to change domestic rules so they can meet the standard of TPP. And uh, we would like to expand uh, CPTPP membership to all the ASEAN countries, uh, provided uh, those countries could meet the standard of TPP. Right. Uh, I was interested in your statement that China is pretending to join the CPTPP. Um, you mean, um, so is, why is China wanting to join and what signal does it send? I'd like to also bring Eric in on this. Well, I, I guess China wouldn't like Taiwan to be a member of TPP, but uh, Taiwan will be ready when they when Taiwan get rid of some import restriction and scientific import restriction I think Taiwan could easily uh, meet the requirement and the standard of TPP and uh, we are hoping uh, Taiwan is a big economic uh, you know member in Asia in Indo-Pacific so we would like to welcome Taiwan. And uh, ROK, South Korea, is 
trying to uh, apply for TPP, they also need to get rid of some import restriction. But uh, I think TPP will be a new uh, rulemaking body for Indo-Pacific. Right. So, Eric, well, where does China fall short in meeting TPP standards? Well, I think, uh, you know, there are different views of this. And, and uh, you know, some some people would argue that maybe the gap is, is smaller than... than uh, uh, maybe often claimed, but I, I, I do agree that there are definitely uh, some areas where, where China uh, very much uh, will need to, to um, change. I, I think it's just before I, I answer specifically that I think it's important to remember a bit the history of, of TPP, which was really, you know, an attempt to, to create a, a set of standards um, uh, and, and in a way, uh, force China, if you want, to, to um, respond or, or to create a sort of competing set of standards to, 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 to China in, in, in Asia. And it's sort of ironic now that China is actually, if you believe uh, what they are doing, they are trying to use uh, CPTPP. Um, and very, this is very, um, doesn't sit very well in your mouth, uh, this abbreviation, but, but uh, Anyhow, what, what is trying, what China is trying to do uh, is to to signal that it wants to uh, improve in those dimensions that I think where it uh, has been falling short in the in the past, particularly when it comes to to uh, some uh, when it comes to state-owned enterprises, when it comes to some uh, some uh, subsidy areas. When it comes, there are a number of areas where clearly uh, it would need to um, to uh, in- improve. The, the positive interpretation of this is that this is uh, a, a way for the government to to uh, really try to address those uh, deficiencies. We will have to see, you know, what, what how they use this and, and whether, uh, as uh, as we just heard it, there might not be a lot of uh, appetite inside CPTPP to to um, to 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 uh, absorb China, and uh, that w- it would be very difficult to absorb. China, China may actually change CPT, CPTPP more than than uh, it would change China. So, so I think this is, uh, you know, clearly something that everyone involved would have to consider. Right. Well, it's, uh, thank you for that. I mean, it, it reminds me of now when China was applying for WTO membership, it did trigger internal changes in China. Yeah. It did trigger you know, I, I, I think that at that time, you know, at that time, it was, of course, a very clear uh, alignment between uh, the internal uh, policies pursued and, and, the, um, and, and the ambitions of, of uh, WTO. I think, I guess it's that what, what uh, Mr. Kono also pointed out, that maybe there's not the same uh, obvious uh, connection between the policies pursued and, and, and but, but, you know, a positive interpretation is that this is really an attempt to fight those special interests that are uh, protecting uh, some of the sectors in, in China. Right. Yeah, you, you are in China now. I mean, you're in Hong Kong, which is part of China. So, I mean, how, how do you feel about China's application to join the CPTP? Do you think it's a good thing that that would help, uh, help China and help businesses there? I think it's, uh, you know, I... Maybe I'm just being idealistic. I, I think that it is still a wonderful catalyst for change. Um, although I, I share Eric's views, I think, you know, particularly now, for example, recently, with the commitment to net zero mm-hmm. and um, a lot of uh, climate change related initiatives, often the SOEs are called in to play a role that is beyond their um, sort of um, a normal uh, fiduciary responsibility. Mm. And, you know, I've been thinking that maybe going forward in the fight for climate change, globally, we may have end up having more companies that have uh, our, our, our SOEs in the form. So um, that's one thought. But I personally think that CPTPP would not really be effective 
unless the U.S. and China are both convinced to join. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, it's about my pay grade, um, <laughs> but it's just that as a you know um, business person, I'd really like to see that um, happen. So, I think that's that's a, that's a that's a big dream, and I I think there are a lot of people, a lot of business people who absolutely share your sentiment there. But I don't know if it's politically realistic. Uh, I don't know if it. I do I do hope it happens myself. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Kono, how would China's application be evaluated? Would it be evaluated purely on the standards of meeting the standards of the agreement, or would there be strategic considerations? as well well uh it seems to me see the communist party of china is trying to uh manipulate uh, corporations more than before and uh, as long as communist party is willing to renounce those manipulating power over their industry uh, china is not going to meet the cp tpp standard so before we talk about strategic consideration, I don't think China is going to be able to meet the standard, period. Okay, well, that's a pretty pretty uh, sharp answer. Well, very good. I think Marjorie uh, wants to come in. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, China is, um, I'm, I mean, I'm in an industry where um, China has complete, I mean, it is completely a market, um, a market with when I first started in the business, it was a state, uh, a lot of a state enterprises in it. Yeah. And as industry became more open, my industry, the textile and apparel industry, is completely market based. I think China is still moving towards that. I think the concern should be limited to areas where it's um, like energy. And I, I see this. Globally, I mean, especially after the Ukraine situation, energy is now going to be every. I, I think that every country is going to be um, uh, having more. The hand, the visible hand, is going to be in um, uh, the energy sector. So I don't know how you know CPTPP would handle that, and not just for China. I, I think this may be end up being a global problem. I, again, I, I seek your wisdom on that. Right. Oh. Very good. Uh, Mr. Uno, I just want to bring you in. I think we are, we are running out of time, uh, but I definitely like to get Indonesia's perspective. Uh, Indonesia has also expressed an interest in joining the CPTPP. Uh, wh wh why, do you, why does Indonesia want to join and what are the challenges that you will face in meeting the standards of the agreement? Well, we believe the agreement... Um been garnered renewed attentions uh, after China, as Mr. Kono uh, said, expressed interest in becoming a member. And uh, I think it has prompted many countries uh, with strong economic and trade relations with China. And we ran a trade surplus uh, with China hopefully this year, uh, after so many years being in deficit. And uh, definitely like to consider uh, joining uh, a platform that would uh, be beneficial uh, and a win-win for world trade uh, and it will boost uh, the economy. Uh, however, there are uh, sensitive issues and challenges uh, in particular for Indonesia. First, uh, on the uh, basically uh, uh, data transfer, data privacy, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, IP rights that we're trying to uh, initiate, uh, making sure that uh, we stand on equal footing and level playing field. Also, uh, logistics is something that we need to navigate, uh, digital regulations, uh, and uh, how do we make sure the um, uh, firms operating in Indonesia would have the competitiveness uh, in terms of uh, 
being part of this uh, uh, this platform. And uh, we saw a research recently saying that uh, around 43% of the firms uh, that exports uh, uh, pretty concerned about new rules being uh, implemented uh, without uh, really a consensus and consultations and uh, data localizations uh, become in particular in relation to consumer protections uh, are, are basically um, going to impact their exports and this is going to be more so for the uh, small medium and micro enterprises uh, who is just joining the digital ecosystem so it will remain uh, something that we would consider uh, definitely in the best interests uh, of uh, the people of indonesia within uh, the charter that we have in our constitutions to participate in the, uh, actually how do we continue to participate in the world trade uh, and uh, we need to have a clear understanding uh, that where uh, this discussion is, is leading. So uh, in short, I think in closing also, uh, we definitely are considering and definitely uh, we are we already have an RCEP, which is like Regional Comprehensive uh, Economic Partnership, uh, which China and Indonesia are already key members. Uh, and this is uh, something that we need to take into consideration. Thank you. Very good. Um, final, final question. It's a very, just a broad question on CPTPP. Um, should the CPTPP avoid expanding too fast or should it try to welcome new members as soon as possible and grow quickly. Um, if I would ask Mr. Kono and Eric uh, and whoever else wants to chip in to address that. Uh, yes. Uh, well, as long as the applicant meet the standard, uh, we can expand CPTPP, uh, no problem. Uh, well, there's a physical limit to the, you know, application process but uh, we will be very happy to increase the membership okay very good eric any thoughts well so i, I so i you know as a uh, sort of acute observer at of, of asia uh, i think uh, it would be wonderful if it expanded uh, and uh, included uh, also, as, as was mentioned, uh, even the United States, that would be, uh, I think, the, the definite, uh, or that would introduce an element into um, the global stage that we badly missing at the moment. And, and uh, it could be an opportunity for very fundamental change. And I wouldn't completely rule it out. And, and certainly there are signals, not, not of membership, but of uh, Creating a sort of accommodating framework in the United States, and, and where, so so um, I think there, I think this in general is a, the fact that uh, Japan revived it. I think has been extremely good for for Asia, and I think it's also something that's very good for the rest of the world. Thank you, Ms. Yang. Uh, from the point of view of business person, I'm sure. Am I wrong in saying that you would like as many people to join as possible? Absolutely. As <laughs> bring everybody into the party and please ASAP because we're running out of time. <laughs> um, so, yes, very definite. Yes. Thank you. On that, on that very positive note, uh, I'm afraid I have to call it to a close. We've crossed our time. It's past nine o'clock, my time. Uh, so I'd like to thank you, panelists, uh, for a very stimulating discussion. So thank you all, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, and goodbye, and stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.